satisfaction for today, okay? Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Risen Savior, started as a home mission church in Lakewood Ranch, Florida, recently became a self-supporting congregation. In August of 2020, they opened a preschool. In addition to teaching children about Jesus, the congregation has been active, connecting and building bridges to parents. It's Harvest Festival at Risen Savior a fun, festive family event for the children who attend the church's preschool. But there's something else going on here. Members of the congregation, even those without small children, are here too. They're connecting with parents, creating an inviting atmosphere, and building relationships. We've invited our congregational members to come and just to be a part of the school and to get to know the, the children and the families and, and trying to merge those two into, into one family. Building that connection between the classroom and the church has been a special focus for Risen Savior's preschool director, Maria Hines, and the entire congregation. God called me. He just placed in my heart a special place for these young children. Doing the early childhood ministry, it's not just about the children, but we are ministering to our parents that are coming in, and the way to do that, building those relationships with them. The growing Lakewood Ranch area attracts young families with children. Seeing this growth, Risen Savior realized a children's ministry could help them connect more families to the gospel message. And as we got to know our community, we saw there is a big need for Christian education. And, and especially at the preschool level, and God has been richly blessing it the last year and a half um, with a lot of families who are coming and giving us a lot of opportunities to share Christ with them. Case in point is the Davis family, who are new to the area, without a church home, looking for quality education. They enrolled their son, Billy. How great it was for Billy, really, uh, um, yeah. in those first few weeks, even he would come home and talk about God and talk and, about... And sing his cute little know, songs, it was so cute. And those kinds of things, which kind of brought us back to maybe, you know, that we should be a little bit more involved and get him growing up in a uh, church community. The preschool has grown from 20 students to over 70, with a waiting list. Families like the Davises are part of that growth. In addition, Risen Savior is working to daughter a mission church in Parish. Certainly, these blessings are from the Lord and demonstrate how He is working through many church members. The goal is a warm, welcoming environment where someone walks into our congregations or our schools and feels connected right from the get-go, that there are people there that care about them. Our Synod has developed a program to help congregations everywhere build that bridge from children's ministries and schools to church membership. It's called Telling the Next Generation. The purpose of Telling the Next Generation is help a congregation have a plan. When they come, how do we connect with them? How do we build relationships? And then how do we connect them with Jesus? Our quality schools bring people to our doors. But the next step, church membership, doesn't happen automatically. It requires an intentional effort by all of us to reach out to school families as we reflect an atmosphere of Christian love. As you've seen, the blessings at Risen Savior have led to efforts to plant a new home mission church 20 minutes north in Parrish, Florida, just east of Tampa Bay. We pray the Lord blesses this new mission to connect with many more families, young and old, so more souls can hear about Jesus Christ. Learn more and stay updated on progress at wells.net forward slash home missions.
Good morning, everyone. Today is the second Sunday of Easter. Sometimes it's called the octave of Easter. Octave, of course, means eight. This is eight days after the, uh, the first Easter. Uh, the ancient world counted both the beginning and the ending when they counted days. That's why the Gospel of Matthew says, eight days later, Jesus appeared to his disciples when Thomas was there. Uh, we would probably say seven days in our culture because we go from day to day, right? But they, uh, they would include both the beginning and the ending. So it's the octave of Easter. Um, introduce our worship service today. We will, first of all, we welcome all of our guests who are with us and those who are watching online. Um, I'll introduce our service today by pointing you to these. They're keys, right? Uh, and keys both open a door and lock it. And that's, this is one of the imagery that the scriptures use about the message that God has entrusted to his people, to his Christians, to the church, if you will. He gives them uh, the keys of the church. I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom of God, Jesus told Peter as the apostolic leader. Uh, and it was not just to Peter and the other apostles. These keys of the word of God have been given to every Christian, including every one of you, huh? uh, to open the doors of heaven by announcing forgiveness, right, the gospel, and when impenitence is encountered, locking the door of heaven out of love for people until they repent, right, so that we can tell them the gospel. That's what our worship service kind of touches on today. The, the keys that have been entrusted to us because the risen Savior, Jesus, gives them to us. Let's begin with the singing of our first hymn.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. And let's do that together. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of God's forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill toward Almighty God, look with favor on your humble servants and stretch out the right hand of our power, of your power, to defend us against all our enemies. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Now turn to God's word for today. The Old Testament lesson that has been chosen is from the Psalms. It's from Psalm 118, verses 22 to 29. These first words are words that Jesus himself quoted uh, to the leaders of the Jews of his day as he was pointing to the fact that he would offer himself as a sacrifice for their sins. That he is the stone of, that the church is built on. And that as the cornerstone, he would be rejected. And that the Lord 
was behind this, that the Lord did this. And as he says, it's marvelous in our eyes that God himself takes on our debt, sends his son to pay for our sins, rises from the grave, and is now the cornerstone for the holy Christian church here on this earth. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. This is our Old Testament lesson for today. Please join me now as we sing the psalm for this worship service. It's Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is a messianic psalm. It's certainly in the one verse there. Uh, it talks about how what a wonderful thing it is to live with the Lord in the land of the living. And it refers to God's Holy One. There's the Messianic reference. Jesus is that Messiah, that Holy One, who conquered death in the grave. And by our connection to him, we too rejoice with God forever and live with him forever. Let's sing Psalm 16. epistle for today, that is the letter of the Apostle Paul, is from his second letter that he wrote to the Christians in the Greek city of Corinth, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. And you need to know the background for this reading. Uh, in his first letter, he had chided the congregation there because they had put up with uh, someone in their midst who was living with his own stepmother in a sexual manner. Huh? 
I was sleeping with her, huh? And Paul chided them. The worst part was they, they were proud of that. They thought they were so liberal-minded they could put up with that kind of open and public sin. He says you need to exercise church discipline on that individual. Out of love for him, you need to point out that sin and remove him from the congregation if he doesn't repent. Lo and behold, he did. He repented. And in the second letter, now Paul tells him, now you have to be good with your forgiveness. And you have to be certain with that forgiveness because he says, as you forgive them, I also forgive them because you are communicating God's forgiveness to him. Here are the words. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Here ends the epistle. And the verse for today, Alleluia, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Alleluia. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for this, the second Sunday of Easter, is from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. These words will also be our sermon text for today. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Here ends the Holy Gospel. Please join me now as we confess our Christian faith. We'll use words that Christians have used for hundreds of years from the fourth century. It's called the Nicene Creed. Let's join together with it. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, 
who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our sermon hymn. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of his spirit be yours now and always. Amen. God's word for our sermon today is based upon the gospel that was read to you earlier from John chapter 20 verses 19 to 23. My dear fellow believers in Jesus Christ, our risen and living Savior, amen. When Jesus rose from the dead, I mean, he could have gone straight to heaven because his work here on this earth as the Messiah was now finished as soon as he was made alive there in the grave and left it. The stone was rolled away, not to let him out, but to let the women and the apostles in to see that the grave was now empty. 
But Jesus hung around on this earth visibly for 40 days after his resurrection in order to appear to his disciples. He did this a number of times as the four gospel accounts tell us. He appeared to them so that he could, he could speak to them and continue to teach them. You see, they still needed his instruction. They still needed his words. For as Christians, it's always about the word of God. It's always about the words of Jesus. What Jesus says, what God says. This is always the most important thing for us. It is in one of these post-resurrection appearances that he speaks to us today. He speaks not only to his disciples here in our text, but he speaks to all Christians of all ages, including us who are gathered here at Shepherd of the Plains Lutheran Church or who are watching online. And so our sermon theme for today is this. The risen Jesus speaks. First off, he announces his peace to us. And then secondly, he communicates his forgiveness through us. It's Easter evening here in our scripture text. Ten of his twelve apostles are gathered in an upper room. Some of the women who had run to the tomb and who had seen the risen Jesus were there in that room. The two Emmaus disciples that Luke tells us about in detail in his gospel, they were there. But instead of rejoicing and having seen the risen Savior, instead of having it sound like it did here in church last Sunday with the words, Christ is risen, and the church hollered, He is risen indeed, huh? They had the doors locked. And they were trembling in fear. The followers of Jesus were afraid. And we're told why in our scripture. For fear of the Jews. The Jewish leaders, you see, had killed God's Messiah. And now Jesus' disciples thought that they would be killed too. And so instead of Easter joy, they still had Good Friday sadness. That sounds way too much like us, doesn't it? We celebrated Easter last week. We heard that Jesus was alive. We believe in Jesus Christ, yes. But fear and anxiety are still with us. Perhaps even during this past week. I ask, was, was it a good week? Was all of your fear and anxiety gone these last few days? Easter didn't make all of our fear-producing things go away, did it? Who of us haven't, hasn't had anxiety and fear over lots of things just in the past few days? Maybe it was because of the political situation here in America where all the hostility and anger is thrown around. Huh? Maybe it was because of health issues in ourselves or in our loved ones' relationships. Maybe it was anxiety over money or relationships in our families or guilt over our past sins or the horror that comes from thinking about our own death. Oh yes, Christ is alive! But so often we're still hiding behind the locked doors of our own mortal fears in living our daily lives. But into the scene steps our risen Savior. And he speaks to us 
as he spoke to those disciples behind locked doors on that first Easter evening. He says, peace be with you. See, that was, that was the regular Jewish greeting that Jesus spoke. It's how the Jews greeted each other. It was like our saying, hello, or how are you, or how you doing, huh? Now, when people say that today, we often answer, oh, I'm fine. I'm just doing great. I'm okay. And we, we might even say that when we're not doing so great, huh? Because that is simply the greeting that we use here in our culture, in our life. But we know that in our text, it was a lot more than just that common greeting. Jesus isn't making small talk here when he says, peace be with you. See, he shows that by saying it again. Because after all, when we want to emphasize something, we say it over and over again. And that's what Jesus did here. He said, a second time, peace be with you. Showing it was a lot more than, hi, how are you? The last time he had talked with most of these people he had, was before he died on the cross. And now his first words to them after that are, peace be with you. And then after he said these words, he accentuated them by showing them his hands and his side. He did that to prove to them he was really Jesus. The same Jesus, the one who had died on the cross on Friday, and now he was alive. He wasn't a spirit. He wasn't a ghost. He had a real flesh and blood body, which he still has today. He had conquered the grave, and he was with them. And that's why we read, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Peace be with you. The risen Jesus speaks. He announces his peace to those disciples. He had won that peace for them on the Friday before. The warfare that sin causes between a holy God and a sinful human race, that had been removed. God the Father, you see, was now no longer angry with sinful mankind over his sins. God had vented his anger upon Jesus, and now he was at peace with his people. This is what Jesus announced to those disciples. Peace. It's the same peace that those angels were talking about when Jesus was born at Christmas. You remember the words. Unto, uh, was born a Savior. Was cry, uh, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace for those on whom God's favor rests. But now that peace was an accomplished fact. Jesus had achieved it. The Bible puts it this way in 2 Corinthians. God was in Christ making peace between himself and the world, not counting their sins against them. Jesus speaks these same words to you and to me today. Peace be with you. In all of our anxieties, in all of our fears, in all of our troubles, in all of our upsetting situations that make up life on this earth, there's our Jesus whispering into our ears, peace be with you. No, Easter is not some magic wand that we wave that makes all of our troubles go away, but Easter is a source of power for us to deal with them. We are right with God. And God is right with us. He is our Lord. And he will be with us in all of our difficulties. And he will make all things work out for our good. No matter how bad they might seem to us. 
so that even in the midst of all of our turmoil, we are safe in the arms of Jesus as he assures us of his peace. Just as we end so many of our sermons with the votum when we say, the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Notice that Jesus speaks it. You see, the peace of Jesus is always rooted in his words. The world around us wrings its hands in anxiety because they don't accept the, the risen Savior's words. In fact, if we're honest with ourselves, we know that we Christians at times wring our hands in anxiety because we don't remember and live the risen Savior's words. We so often can lose the comfort of having Jesus speak his peace to us. When we cut ourselves off from the only place that Jesus speaks to us. And that's in the Holy Scriptures. huh? Instead of tuning into Jesus and to his words, so often we tune into the earthly wizards that are out there. huh? The so-called experts. Or we tune into our own feelings and emotions. Or to the worldly wisdom of our society around us. But if you don't live in the gospel promises of Jesus found in the Bible, you'll never be at peace with God or at peace with other people around you or even at peace with yourself. Because it is the words of Jesus that give us the power to live both now and forever. And now that leads us to a follow-up here in our text. Jesus shows us where to hear those words that are spoken to us, and to the center of those words spoken to us. We read, again, uh, we read it. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The peace that Jesus gives us is found in the forgiveness of sins that he has won with his perfect life in our place and his innocent death in our place, followed by his resurrection from the dead. And the risen Jesus sends his followers out into the world to communicate that forgiveness to other people. The risen Jesus communicates his forgiveness through us. Verse 23 here in our text is the heart and the core of the message that Jesus gives to all of his followers to communicate to the world. The NIV translates it this way. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. A better, more literal translation of that original Greek that you have here in our text is a lot closer to that, that old King James version that many of us memorized when we were younger, right? And that goes like this. Whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. And whosoever sins you do not forgive, they are not forgiven. Jesus' point here is that whenever his followers announce forgiveness to another person, that's always a fact for that person as they announce it. And likewise, whenever his followers refuse to announce forgiveness to another person, that's always a fact for that person that they announce it to. The point again is that we are the faces and we are the lips of Jesus himself to the world. God has, a trust, God has entrusted his word to us. All of his word, gospel and law, so that whenever we speak the word, that's Jesus Christ himself speaking that word to people. The risen Savior speaks. He communicates his forgiveness through us. It sounds contradictory, doesn't it? I mean, Jesus says we're supposed to announce forgiveness. And then in the next breath, he says, we're not supposed to announce forgiveness. And we rightly ask, 
How are we supposed to do that? Well, when people indicate to us that they know they are sinners, when they demonstrate that they are confessing their sins, showing that they are sorry for their sins, when they experience remorse for the evil that they have done, or said, or even thought, then we announce forgiveness. We communicate to them, Christ lived and died for you. And because of him, you are forgiven. I forgive you in the name of Christ, we can say. huh? Really, we, we have no choice in this matter. We have to say that. An evangelical pastor can't open his lips without preaching the gospel. And when we do that, Jesus himself is speaking to that person through us. That's God assuring that person of the forgiveness that Jesus won for that individual there on the cross. And not just church leaders, but every Christian has that right. Every Christian has that duty, yes, to speak this forgiveness to our world. Yes, God wants every Christian to speak this forgiveness to another person who is squirming over his or her sins. That is the marching orders for the whole Christian church on earth. But what's this business about not forgiving sins? Well, we Christians are only to announce this forgiveness to those that we can see are sorry for their sins to penitent people. Because if people are not sorry for their sins, if they're impenitent over their sins, then we dare not tell them that they are forgiven. Because that would harm them. They are not in a position to believe it. That would only be throwing our precious pearls of the gospel to the pigs, as Jesus says on another occasion. Because a person who refuses to be sorry for a sin is simply unable to believe that Jesus has forgiven it. And so in love for a person who refuses to repent of their sins, we must tell them they are not forgiven. Not because Jesus didn't die for that sin and win forgiveness for it, but because of their impenitence, they are not able to possess it for themselves. And we always tell people this in the hope that they will change their mind and that they will repent and come back so that we can announce the gospel. Now the question that still begs the question, how do we know? How do we know whether a person is sorry for their sin or not? How do we know whether we're supposed to tell a person they're forgiven or tell them they're not forgiven? We cannot look into people's hearts. We are not God, right? We cannot judge motives. And so we act on the basis of whether they say they are sorry for their sins or not. And then we take a look at their actions to see whether their actions line up with their words. We assume people mean what they say and accept that they are sorry for their sins when they say so, unless their actions overrule their words. For example, if someone says, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I lost my temper. I'm sorry I told that person off my profanity, but the next time I see him or her, I'm going to holler at him even more loudly and use even greater profanity. Then we know that their confession of sin was a fake. It was a put on. As a general rule, we assume that people are penitent over their sins and we will announce forgiveness freely and readily unless we are forced to admit that someone is just telling us what they want us to hear. This precious doctrine in the Bible is called the ministry of the keys, or some people call it the use of the keys. The risen Jesus Christ communicates his forgiveness to people through us, through his followers, through the church. This is just another way of saying that the work of Christ's church here on this earth is mission work. Always mission work. It's the announcing of his gospel to people and of his law to other people. And the fact that Jesus has entrusted this work to us, that moves us to be, to be faithful 
and diligent in doing the best we can in sharing that word with other people, especially in the announcing of Jesus' forgiveness, which is always what we want to get to. Because when we do that, Martin Luther in the Catechism says that this is as valid and certain in heaven also as if Christ our dear Lord dealt with us himself. What a privilege and responsibility it is for us Christians that the risen Jesus speaks and communicates his forgiveness through us. Jesus has seen, to fit, seen fit to use the very people who need that forgiveness that he has won to give that same forgiveness to others. That's what drives people on to become pastors and teachers in the public ministry of the church. But the very forgiveness that your pastor preaches every Sunday morning is something that he desperately needs in his own daily life. And so also the people in your life, your family members, your friends, your co-workers, what they need from you more than anything else is your assurance, your announcement to them that because of Jesus, their sins are forgiven. What a privilege that is that we can speak that forgiveness to these people and do it regularly. And even if at times we are forced to withhold forgiveness because of people's impenitence, we'll always do so craving that these people will change their tune so that we can announce the forgiveness that they won after they repent. The risen Jesus speaks. He announces his peace to us and he communicates his forgiveness through us. May God remind us all how important it is for us to receive this power of Jesus' gospel so that we can share the content of his gospel correctly with others. And may he bless our witness to his eternal glory. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which is beyond our human understanding, will keep our hearts and our minds centered in Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. seated as we now gather our offerings.
with ourselves, with our families, and with our community. In the name of your Son, Jesus, your Heavenly Father, we pray this. Amen. We now continue with the prayer of the church. You may remain seated. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, bringing us to another Easter season where Sunday after Sunday we can once again remember that Christ is risen, risen indeed, risen to prove his divinity, risen to prove our forgiveness, risen to prove that the grave's not the end, but we will rise from the grave to a whole new life, a better life in heaven with you. We thank you that that peace that passes all understanding is ours that our sins no longer can rise up to haunt us because you have taken care of our debt. And we thank you that you in your infinite mercy decided to use us very sinners who need the gospel so much to share it with others. Clay pots though we are, you have decided that we will be your face and your words to our world. So may we be empowered by that gospel to share it with people in our daily lives, in our families and among our friends at work and in our communities. May people see your amazing love in us as we travel here on this earth until you call us home to heaven. Today we place into your care Carla Bremer, Bre Bremer uh, who's in hospital. We ask you to be with her and with the doctors and the nurses and to help them to diagnose the issues and as she awaits uh, possible surgery to bless the surgeon and those who attend to him, him or her uh, as and to give her full and complete healing if that is your will uh, sure uh, take away any anxiety that she might have any fear that uh, about what will happen to know that in your hands those are safe arms safe hands to be in that you will make all things work out for her good and we also place into your care Margie Bates as she awaits the call from this earth to heaven. Uh, be with her, alleviate her pain, be with her daughters as they attend to her until finally you take her home to heaven. Lord, and we pray for those who come to the Holy Sacrament today. May the body and blood that's there in with and under the bread and the fruit of the vine in the Holy Sacrament be your word in a very special form to assure us that sins are forgiven peace is there between you and us and that we have power to live whatever you give us to do day after day. All these things and whatever else you would have us pray for, we pray it in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand as we continue with our Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we praise you especially for the glorious resurrection of your Son, the true Passover Lamb, who by his sacrifice took away the sins of the world, and by his resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Our Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples and take and said saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me then after the same manner also he took the cup after supper and after he had given thanks gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
body and blood of Jesus, strengthen us and keep you in saving faith and life and Now live with the peace and the joy of being a Christian, knowing that the best is yet to come for you, and God will take you to heaven some time away. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Please be seated and join me in our closing hymn.
Once again, a good morning to all of you. Uh, on Sunday mornings, we had one today, and we'll have three more Sundays of discussion of some popular Christian songs, popular at least that I've uncovered them. Probably got a million other ones out there that I have no exposure to, but we'll take a few that I know. Uh, there'll be five of them every Sunday, and we talk about it. I won't be here next week, but I've got it all recorded, the songs, and you can moderate yourselves as you listen to the music and discuss that in the light of Scripture. Um, also, I recorded my sermon for next week, uh, and your lay leadership will lead you in the readings in the rest of the worship service. Uh, Kim and I are leaving after our service today. We'll be getting to Kansas yet later this evening, and then we'll be getting back home to Wisconsin on Monday evening. I'll be flying back on May 7th. Okay, May 7th, and so I'll be here for our May 8th worship service. That also will be a communion service. We kind of flipped it around for the month of May, May 8th, and uh, will be a communion service. And then also uh, May 22nd, which will be a confirmation Sunday for Isaac and graduation for Anna. Uh, observance. And that will be my last Sunday that I'll be here in Texas. I am going to record services also for our May 29th and for June 5th. And then after that, it looks like past, if Pastor Hans Tomford from Amarillo will be your vacancy pastor, hopefully for just a few weeks, maybe even just a couple weeks. Uh, graduation from the seminary is May 27th, the week before is call day. I'll be there for that. And uh, didn't include it in our prayers for today, but in your personal prayers, ask the Lord to give us a candidate, be assured that that he will answer that prayer in the best possible way. I think the chances for us getting a graduate are very, very good. And um, so that you will have your full-time pastor here by maybe end of June, first or middle part of July. Uh, I wanted to call your attention to Forward in Christ. That's our church's magazine. Uh, there are two of them there that you can pick up. I don't, some of you have maybe picked up the one for Easter, this one. And then the one after Easter uh, is this one. They're both in the back there. Take them along. Give them away. Give them to people. Really some excellent articles, faith stories in there. Uh, there are some Bible studies always they include in there. I think they do a pretty good job. Make it a, an appealing magazine, I think. And I wanted to read this to you. Uh, our brothers and sisters in New Mexico, the Asplunds. Uh, it's a, uh, if I pronounce this right, Gerald. Is that... Help me out. Did I pronounce that right? Gerald's college graduation, May 14th. Um, the Aspens have invited the whole congregation here. Uh, it's at 10 a.m. at uh, Greyhound Arena. That's in Portales. Portales. That's the name of town. Okay. Eastern New Mexico University in Portales. Yes. And they've invited the whole congregation to go over there that Saturday morning if you'd like to fit that. And I'm, I'm hoping I'll be here back by then. I'm hoping that I can make it over there finally meet their fellow Christians there. They know a lot about me because they see me online, but you know, I've had this with other of our members. 